People are crazy, man. <laughs> you end up doing north of $4 million this year. I felt that power where I could buy literally anything that I wanted. You seemingly just exploded <laughs> there. Dude, I don't do that much, honestly. You get rid of the house, you're free again, you got all the autonomy you want. And it's like, I don't know if I should take that as an insult or <laughs> if like it's unique. At the end of the day, it's like I'm still kind of figuring it out. Right, so I guess just getting into it, um, one thing uh, you know I've been interested to learn more from you is uh, you know I've been kind of following your content here for a while. Um, is a bit more about your your life philosophy. You know you got this one person business, you've been become quite niche famous for, um, and been blowing up on on YouTube and all platforms. And curious to understand kind of yeah, what's your life philosophy in one sentence? Ooh, <laughs> one sentence. That's rough because the, we were talking a bit before this where I've kind of come full circle recently and really realized what my life philosophy is. So I guess now is I haven't been able to condense it into one sentence just because it was on my mind a lot yesterday. But if I had to, it would be that in order to figure out what you want, you have to figure out what you don't want. And we can dive further into that. But like in a sense, my life philosophy is do what you want, but that can be misconstrued very quickly. Because the common yeah. advice or the common thing around that when I post is like, oh, so if my friend jumps off a cliff, then and I want to jump off a cliff, then I should. And it's like, no, that's not what you want. That's what's been in that case and in many people's cases, what's been conditioned into your head as to what you want. So it's what do you want? And then you pursue that. You make mistakes along the way because that's just implied. And then through those mistakes, it's self-corrective to the point of you actually getting what you truly want and i don't know if you ever reach that point but that's what makes the entire journey fun well, let's keep diving in so in terms of you know moving on to your your business side of things right give a bit of uh, context in terms of like what you've built over the last few years um and give us a sense of kind of over the past year like what does revenue look like the team size how have you kind of built things out yeah so revenue last year was around eight hundred thousand dollars and then this year, or like, it's, it's insane, like how it just boomed exponentially when things started to take off across like all platforms. And yeah, so massive congrats on that, by the way, the growth <laughs> and like you, is well deserved. You've been, you know, yeah, coming up with insane content ideas and pushing the envelope in many senses and, and love the creativity. So you'll continue. Yeah. I appreciate it, man. And just like to loop back and tie that into what I've been thinking about recently and literally what we just talked about is. Like I know I'm, I'm slowly becoming more conscious that I just want to write like that's it. I want to write, walk, gym, eat healthy, like focus on that stuff and really focus on just novel ideas. That's kind of my favorite thing to do. That's where I feel like my edge lies and what I have a lot of fun doing every single day. But with that, when that started to take off, literally the bulk of that revenue last year was in the last quarter. And so from January to now, I'm at about 1.8 million in revenue. And so if that continues, it's June. So six month, if I can double that, especially with the book launch, then hopefully we're looking at three to 4 million when I originally projected 2.5. And so now if I'm projecting three to four and things continue to exponentially increase, then could go five or six, who knows? I'm I'm okay. kind of just like letting it happen and doing what I know I need to do. Uh, but in terms of team size, with all of that stuff, I kind of took on some bloat. Like that's the common theme right now is like I went through a phase of intensity and that's kind of like bulking in bodybuilding where you get to a point where you gain a bit too much fat. You just feel sluggish. You don't like what you see. And then you start to cut back, but maintain the levers or the baseline amount of business, mental, physical muscle that you've built. And so team size right now, I don't have any actual employees. And this is where the one person business kind of gets fuzzy. And that's why I teach it as like a beginner method. I technically wouldn't consider myself as having a one person business right now, but I'm kind of trying to get back to it because I really enjoy the challenge of seeing how much I can make and how much I can impact people as one person. And I feel like nobody's really tested or discovered the limits of that yet. 
especially in the creator economy. But right now I have four subcontractors. Two of those are just community managers. Like they just answer questions in the community. Um, one is Joey who manages the community and helps with uh, digital economics. And then Devin, my, he's YouTube editor and support guy. The rest is really kind of me. And wow. yeah, well, that's the, that's the thing is I had this conversation on like a previous podcast too, where it's like, Oh, how do you do so much? It's like, dude, I don't do that much. Honestly, it's like the, the products sell themselves. That doesn't require any of my time really, because Joey and the other people are handling that all of my attention is focused on like the book is already written. So I have a lot of time there like literally all of my time is just focused on the newsletter, writing tweets, checking into community stuff here and there and like knocking out little tasks that come up. There's honestly not much that goes into it to be quite honest. I, I honestly don't know what is considered one person business anymore because I know so many people say that they're one person business, but then they have like a VA or two VAs and they hire freelancers. I like to think of one person business as like, I'm the business. And I'm going to hire people to aid in what I would already be doing myself, but just didn't have the time to do. To kind of break that down a bit, let's just say this year, you know, you end up doing north of $4 million this year, right? Like what's the kind of breakdown? Like you got a lot of things you've been doing, you know, you've got the programs, you got the community, you got the upcoming book. Like how do you kind of see that breakdown uh, going over 2023? And then as you move into, you know, 2024, like which of those areas are you like most excited to propel and grow? Quick breakdown is Modern Mastery has been hovering around like 40, 50 K a month just for the past year or so. And then to our writer, like the, the thing with digital products, whether it be to our writer or digital economics is that the, the most sales come from like either a launch period or a cohort period. And that's why I like running the like quarterly solopreneur sprints, which is like a method of getting more people into digital economics. And so to our writer had like a big spike. It was like a two, $300,000 launch. And then that pulls in, I think like 75 K a month just from organic traffic and like me plugging newsletters every day. And then digital economics that pulls in again about a hundred thousand dollars a month and then when the sprints go out that's like when the huge spike happens because the the scarcity is kind of just baked in where i have a three-week promotion period where i just go really hard on that and i really like that method of promotion because then throughout the rest of the time i can just focus on high quality content and i don't have to continue i don't have to really promote at all if i don't want to and can yep. just like sit back, focus, and then have that scheduled period of intensity leading up to a launch. And then the last solopreneur sprints cohort brought in $700,000 in the course wow. of that three weeks. And so that's like kind of my way of measuring progress is like how much those intense periods of promotion, either a launch or cohort bring in. And so the next one, um, that's kind of how I schedule everything in terms of just promoting in general. So the sprints happen the past two quarters and then next quarter is going to be the book and there's going to be like a limited edition thing. And I'm going to go hard on promoting that. So hopefully that I don't think it'll, since it's a book, I don't think it'll get close to like the 700 K I hope it would, that would be cool, but that'll be like a spike in revenue and then also building a software, which would be the next quarter spike in revenue. And then after that, possibly my last course slash product uh, spike, and then just continue with the solopreneur sprints. And it's like every single quarter I've, I have something to look forward to and like channel my attention into and revenue reflects that. You know, you've been at this for a long time, grown out an audience of over 3 million people. Now I'm fascinated by the YouTube side of things. You mm -hmm. seemingly just exploded <laughs> there. Um, yeah. and I, but I know you've been at it for some time and so it's not, you know, it's one of those situations where it looks like an overnight success, but no, you've been, you've been at this for a long time now. Um, you know, an amazing channel, highly focused around systems around one person businesses. 
um, grown that to over 310k subs. You talk a little bit about there's a link between your newsletters and the YouTube. Like, give me a little bit of a purview into like the strategy behind the scenes. So a lot of it was unconscious competence because a lot of people when it was happening, it's like, dude, how are you doing this? Like, what's the growth strategy? And I was just sitting back like. I have no clue, dude. Like the video just did really well. <laughs> and then like, I was like, okay, double down on that topic. And then the next ones were like, okay, we're incorporating one person business more. That's working, working, working. Right. And then that kind of built the momentum and created a new baseline as to where like now I can just maintain that. And eventually I'll strike gold again and have that big intense period. That's That's kind of how I like to make sense of it is just, the balance of consistency and intensity and one leading to another. Like if you aren't consistent with some form of content or really anything in your life, then you're not going to allow yourself to hit that point of intensity where you're making massive progress. And so with YouTube, I noticed that where it's like, okay, I'm posting these videos. I feel good about these videos. I'm kind of just in the flow. I like making them. Um, and then I, noticed not only like that the justin welsh podcast of the one person business xyz like that was starting to do really well and so i'm like okay maybe there's something here and then i just wrote the newsletter on like my view of the one person business and i felt like i got pretty creative with that where i was giving people different routes to take it was it wasn't like counter to what other people were saying but it gave beginners a very good framework for getting started and just understanding the entire scene a lot better. And so when I turned that into a YouTube video, I kind of already knew that, okay, this topic alone, the one person business is going to be, it's going to do a bit better than any of my other videos, just because that's its nature from what I've observed online. And from there, I woke up, it was like, it, it took like a week where it was getting about the same views as my other videos. And then a week later, it just started like flying and I was like, what is going on? Me and my editor were both like refreshing YouTube studio and it just blew up to 400,000, 500,000, 700,000 views. And then we had that surge of motivation from that. And it's like, okay, we're doubling down on this. Uh, all of the next newsletters are going to be focused around this. They're going to follow the same structure. And we kind of built that momentum and the other videos followed it. And it, that's kind of the strategy where if I were to break it down, that's going back to when I said it was unconscious competence, like my titles and thumbnails and even descriptions, like those are kind of more natural and I don't want to say better than other people's, but they're better than the average just because I've been writing copy so long, I've been writing content so long. It's like, I know what ideas hit. I know what ways of wording things hit just because I've seen so much data over the past three years of especially growing on Twitter. This is why I recommend Twitter so much is because if you can write like a short form sentence and it hits that transfers over into so many different things. Yep. And I had some past experience in design where I created Photoshop art. So like I do my own thumbnails. I've heard that it's interesting when like, I've talked to some big YouTubers now where they're like, yeah, I, I never would have thought that your thumbnails would do well. And it's like, I don't know if I should take that as an insult or <laughs> if like it's unique. <laughs> so it's like, thanks. But so I don't know at the end of the day, it's like, I'm still kind of figuring it out where I like a lot of my thumbnails suck and my titles suck and the videos will do trash for a bit and then I'll change it up a bit and they'll catch up to the other ones eventually. But no, there's definitely been some lower periods too, where I felt like I wasn't making any progress and like YouTube was slowly coming to a halt. But at the same time, the main thing I've learned with both YouTube or any social media in general is people want to follow you for your best ideas. And the best way I can put this is thinking about it from your favorite artist or musician where you love an album by them because it has that same tone. It has that same vibe and you just like it. That's why you like the artist. But when they come out and they're like, oh, we're gonna switch from punk to pop. And then they release the album and you hate it. And you're like, I'm not gonna listen to this because I just don't like it. And so if they would have just maintained their same like punk vibe with different notes, AKA like ideas here and there, 
then you're going to keep growing and people are going to develop that brand loy loyalty over time and you're going to become timeless in a sense. And so on things like Twitter, it's like you slowly take note of your best performing content and you just revise it and make it better over time from a better place of experience. And so it's like the whole say one thing a thousand different ways, but that's hard. That's really difficult. Hmm. And so that's the main challenge is like, how do I consistently over the years? Cause people will say this, they'll stick it out a month in content creation and they're like, okay, what are my best ideas? And they don't have any because they don't have data or traffic to actually tell them. So there's a lot of momentum that has to be built there and a lot of consistency and sticking it out and persistence that has to be had before you can even reach that point. Uh no, and I love that idea too. I mean, we've all experienced those, you know, moments or periods on a given social media platform where it's just like that long, slow crawl. And I think that's where mm -hmm. most people just end up giving up. You know, they don't get the results. They're not seeing that quick spike. They don't get that dopamine rush over two months. And so they just say, screw it, I'm out. And when you think about the title and the packaging of say a YouTube video, is that something that you're doing at the end after the you know actual video has been made? Or do you like to kind of do that at the beginning and then pick the best you know thumbnail title combo and then choose to make that video? My process is kind of all over the place <laughs> where sometimes it, it's like, well, the thing is, is sometimes I'll come across an idea that I hear and it's like, oh, I could turn this into some kind of uh, concept or system. And then it's like, okay, I need to incorporate that concept or system in the newsletter itself, like the one person business, right? It's like, okay, that's going to be included in the newsletter. And then it's going to impact the title of it. Mm -hmm. But there's other times where it's like, I just start writing the newsletter and it's like, okay, something's showing up here. How can I structure this in the best way possible? And then I create that concept or idea or whatever. And I just find it like along the journey of writing that newsletter. And it's like, yeah, that's the perfect title. So it's really variable where it depends how you start and write the newsletter or YouTube video in and of itself. But I think you can always have confidence that your content, your long form content newsletter or YouTube video has a very big idea in there. And once you identify that, that's can be used as the title and you can shift some things around in the actual content to make that idea stand out and be more impactful. Yeah. By kind of persevering, keeping on putting things out, you know, you know, at some point you're going to start getting some data and insight in your case, it's this one person business and this interview with Justin Walsh that kind of then starts to give you a glimmer of like, Hey, there's something here. I'm going to double down. What I love about that is it kind of follows. Uh, what I call like a content waterfall system. You know, you have your mm -hmm. one pillar piece of content, which for you, it sounds like it's that newsletter piece that becomes a blog that becomes pieces of your Instagram stories and Instagram carousels and so on and so forth. And so, yeah, if you can find that way of kind of making one piece of content into 14 other pieces of content, I think you can really lean much more deeper into that core pillar content and make something that mm -hmm truly proud of that it sounds like with your audience, they, they really notice it. They're like, damn, this is so authentic. This is so not salesy and just genuinely valuable. Um, and it sounds like that's, what's getting a lot of them across the line. What's the kind of, you know, system that you use there? Like how does that one newsletter piece of content, like how many other pieces of content does that create for you? Right now it's only the YouTube video because right. I, I used to, I used to condense it into like a Twitter thread and then turn that into a carousel in the past. Um, and I may go back to that. Like I, I did that for a long period of time right now. It's just like, it, it could bring me better results, but I am kind of enjoying the balance of like, it's either very long form or it's extremely short form, like Twitter versus newsletter. Cause in between that, I feel like I, like, that's not my best writing with threads. Like it just, it gets too watered down for me. And I, it's either, I want a punchy idea or I want something long fleshed out, nuanced, etc. So. In the past, it used to get repurposed quite a bit, but now it's just like newsletter to YouTube video, plug those both under short form content, and then try to articulate like the best ideas from it in a tweet. And then the tweet gets repurposed to all platforms, like literally copy pasted to LinkedIn, post it in like an Instagram, just post template or post it on YouTube in the awesome. community page. 
And when you think about like the growth you've been seeing across your businesses, right? Like that's explosive, right? Like 800K last year, looks like you're gonna do about 5X that this year, right? And at the same period, you know, you've grown a massive Twitter following, YouTube's been blowing up. How do you kind of look at like, what's attributing to that revenue growth? Like, you know, when you look at the breakdown of where your audience is coming from, like is, you know, the 300K subs you've added over the last, you know, 18 months, is that responsible for half that revenue you think? Or how do you kind of look at that? I'd like to attribute it to long form because just from my own nature. Newsletters, right? Newsletters, YouTube videos, podcasts. uh, Like I, I like to see those as the main sales drivers, but also it's like nurturing and sales drivers there. And then top of funnel is just like audience acquisition and like getting some big ideas across, like just getting my name in people's mouths. And then they eventually transfer over into long form. Um, But like, yeah, the biggest unlock for me was just trying to create, trying to make sense, trying to help people understand what's in my mind or the things that I'm reading and learning about, right? And just through long form writing, because the the thing with that, with long form, man, the way that I like to think about it is like, the more attention you hold throughout your entire lifetime, the more power you have. And so what I mean by that is on Twitter, one tweet, is going to hold their attention for maybe like 10 seconds, right? And so if you post three tweets a day, you're maybe you maybe have 30 seconds of their attention. And there's no like nurturing going on there, really, there's no like investment that they're giving to you. Same thing goes with shorts, reels, etc. I'm not saying those things are not useful for the purpose that they serve. But with newsletter or YouTube video, they're giving you five, 10, 20 in podcasts, sometimes even like an hour of their attention to you. And that stacks up over time. That's where the nurturing comes into play. And so you can think of the attention that you're holding as the trust that you're building with that person and the amount of trust you have with a person the easier it's going to be for them to trust you when buying a product or service from you. And then that again, still holds the same principle where a problem that I see in many people's brands is that they put off launching a product or service and they're not building the authority that comes from having a product, right? Like half of the people that have taken to our writer, how do I put it? The, the people on social media that grow very big and then lose steam and stop getting a ton of engagement, like people on Twitter where they grow big and they had a ton of engagement, but then they kind of die off. And it's usually because they don't have a product service or something deeper because let's take James clear, for example. James Clear cannot post for a year on Twitter, and then he can come back and just type the word habits, hit post, and it'll go viral because he has, he's held so much attention. He's occupying so much mental real estate, even outside of them being on social media. So that's my entire intention with the book is like, how am I going to kind of make myself immortal in a sense without with the least amount of effort or the most leverage. And so the more in products with them actually taking action and you changing their lifestyle and habits and for the better, they're going to attribute that progress to you. And it's going to come back full force for your brand growth because they're going to engage with your stuff, no matter what you say, like you could type whatever you want, but they're like, Oh, I just like this guy. Like I've taken his stuff. He's helped me. I like Dan, so I'm going to like and retweet every single one of his posts. And so that's kind of a hidden engagement metric that people don't take into account and that people put off for so long because they think that selling is too salesy or that they're not actually helping someone or that like courses are intangible and they're not worth the money. Like it's, I don't know, the justifications that people come up with in their heads that aren't reality. On the, you know, keyframe side of things, like, how do you then decide that you're going to move forward with that? And how do you kind of differentiate amongst all these things between like, yeah, I should do this, this is a good idea, or mm-hmm. this is shiny object syndrome and me getting distracted from what I do in the core business? Like, how do you kind of differentiate there? So Keyframe is an interesting business model where I'm technically the founder, 
but I'm just the face of it. I'm just the lead generation mechanism where people behind it, uh, I could name drop, but I don't know. Good people, like incredible people. One's like an investor. The other has built multiple like eight figure agencies in the past. And so he has the know-how and the operations in order to build it up and do it in a much more successful way than I could on my own. And so for me, it's like, I already knew the demand was there with the animations. So it's just a matter of him coming in and using my audience to fuel the agency that we could provide for. So that doesn't require literally any of my time. It's just like, I get a specific percentage. Um, and that's, that decision was a bit easier for me to make for that reason. It didn't demand really anything from me right now. I don't have too much of a desire to build something like build a massive company. Yep. I feel like I've been adopting Justin Welsh's mindset more and more because yep. it's a good one, man, where it's like even this past, like however long where it's like, I've tried buying certain things. Like I don't, I'm slowly re or quickly realizing actually that I don't need much to have like a good life where it's yep. like, I've experienced like a pretty substantial amount of money for just who I am. And like, I have ha I've felt that power where I could buy literally anything that I wanted. And I don't know, it, it, I felt like it would turn me into a bad person. <laughs> so it's a, like, I don't know, right now, I don't really have the desire to like really go any further. And that's a challenge I'm battling with as well, because that's what's brought me the most fulfillment is pushing higher and higher and higher to the next level. Um, and so now it's like, I'm kind of shifting that focus to, I just want to go higher and higher and higher in terms of like my creative capacity and the ideas that I'm delivering and become on par with the people that I admire, like Naval, Alan Watts, Jordan Peterson. And I know that the money coming in will reflect that. Right. And so as you kind of, I love that goal, right? Like getting to just like your highest creative self. I think that's like an amazing calling in business and there's a spiritual element to that. I think it's just also just yep. like a, amazing kind of personal growth um yeah and i'm sure it gives you like a ton of meaning as well in terms of like shiny object syndrome i'm absolutely terrible at it man like i get caught up in shit all the time i, I don't know i just found myself at the store wanting a watch and i bought one and i got home looked at it and i just hated what i saw and i was like thank god they have a return policy return that thing and i don't know that's kind of my method of learning where i screw up a lot a lot a lot but I attribute that to like over time, I'm slowly getting better at the decisions that I make. And like, I'm not closing myself off to making mistakes in the future because eventually the, like it's going to become solidified in my head where I've always made like decent decisions around like my goals and partying in college. But at the same time, it's like, I didn't close myself off to it because eventually I realized that partying that often got in the way of me achieving certain things in my life. Right. And then that slowed down for a bit. And now it's slowly become like, okay, I wasn't a fan of cutting drinks out of my life for good because I tried that and it just led to like a bad relationship with it. And now it's like, I have no appeal or desire to drink. But when I do, it's usually just like, one to three drinks at a nice dinner with other people that I enjoy my time with there. And that's like so much more infrequent than before where it's like, I've made the mistakes up to that point where it's just like subconsciously, I know what my decision is already going to be just because I've already gone through the trial and error and gotten mad at myself so many other times from making the past mistakes. And in terms of, uh, you know, I'm looking at, you know, a bunch of your, you know, tweets here online and, um, you have this interesting way of kind of like you're saying, like remixing uh, certain things that are, you know, written in more of like a self-help, self-improvement, these mm -hmm. sorts of ways and having it in your sort of own like life philosophy, which has that elements of kind of like stoicism and a few other elements. to them. I'm curious, like what books have been most influential to you um, over the last sort of few years of your life? The main one is Flow by Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. That's yeah. like evolutionary psychology. Um, I really enjoy his perspective on things. It just reads well to me. It's like, Oh, I get this. This makes sense. This is, Oh, this is why I felt this way in my life. 
here's I'm going to try and replicate that more. Um, all of his books are good. I'd recommend them all. But Flow is the main one, like an introductory. Uh, the Power of Now is was kind of my introduction to spirituality and just knowing that there is depth behind life like that I don't like I don't have to be super reactionary there's I don't know there's a lot more than just focusing on the pain and problems in your life and if we want to frame it this way it was kind of my way of going from strict religious household to me rebelling and becoming atheist to me reading that book and opening my mind to the thought of God again. Right. Yeah. And then that leading into where I am now, which is finding people like actualize.org on YouTube and Alan Watts and just being open to this stuff that has shaped so much of my life. Right. If I hadn't found that book, I would not be here, even yeah. though it can, it can turn some people off. So if you read that book, I'd recommend you go into it with an open mind. Um, next one is, Ken Wilber, A Brief History of Everything. That dude's model for just life in general blows my mind every single time I read it. And it's helped me think differently about content creation and just how things are interconnected and how I can like incorporate some of what he says into the structure, like how I write. It's kind of, if you perceive it this way, like that book, A Brief History of Everything, just understanding literally everything that's like creative fire creative firepower. Like it allows you to see the ideas you have differently and be able to deliver them. But that's not what the book is about. That's just kind of how I read it. So mm. highly recommend that one. Rest. Rest by Alex Sujung Kimpong. That taught me a lot about rest and the balance of that and productivity. Most of what I listen to, like if you can, I'd recommend binge watching uh, a lot of actualize.org's videos on YouTube. They're like three hours long. That's why I like to walk so much is because then I can actually finish them and I don't have to sit down for three hours. And I don't know. He has some stuff. He has some like slander online. Like if you look him up, there's, I don't know. There, there's a thing when you get to a certain level on YouTube, there's going to be negative things said about you. I'd recommend, like I've encouraged people to go and watch him. And then they instantly come back with, oh, I found this on Google. He seems like a terrible human being. And I'm like, you just, so you're writing off thousands of hours of his life's work and distilling multiple philosophies and like arguably the, one of the greatest YouTubers in terms of value, just because you read that someone made a decision because of one word that he said in his YouTube video. There's a lot of nuance. Approach all of this with an open mind, but at the same time, just be mindful. Like I never, I've never seen a necessarily like bad side of actualize.org. That's just me. So him, Alan Watts lectures, Jordan Peterson lectures, of course, and all of them have differing worldviews, but at the same time, I'm a big fan of like perspective collection where like, if you get offended by one perspective, that's an argument that you need to learn more about it. It's be, you don't like it because you don't understand it. And so, I mean, that reflects across everything, like even the vegan diet. It's like, I'm not a vegan, but I'm not necessarily closed off to it. So to say, it's like, I need to understand their perspective and I need to understand what's missing from their perspective so that I can learn that as well. And eventually have this holistic worldview where I can operate the best within and the, be the least reactionary and get the best results. Makes a lot of sense. And yeah, no, drawing inspiration from, you know, Ken Wilber all the way to stoicism and everything mm -hmm. between like flow. I mean, yeah, being able to kind of pick the best pieces and form your own sort of life philosophy, your own perspective on God and spirituality, I think is an important part of, you know, just being a critical thinker online and also being creative. You know, it's about coming up with our own approach to things, our own beliefs and, and not um, just relying on, you know, what we hear from others or, you know, the status quo. Um, mm -hmm. Curious on, on your side, like, you know, after reading all then all these different sources and, you know, these different videos on actualize.org, like what is kind of like your approach to spirituality? And as you kind of, you know, have this book on the way, give us a sense of just, you know, how, how, what's your approach to even just writing this book and, and, and what's it all about? In terms of spirituality, I'd say like I fall along the lines of non-duality or like the law of one or 
that there is an underlying metaphysical fabric that is beyond words. And the, the way that I like to put it is that being comes before knowing and that you can't like you can't wrap one inside the other where it's like being is literally everything and the patterns within that and how it's consistently evolving and creation, destruction, unity, division, everything happening and unfolding before you in the present moment. And then knowing comes from that. And so it's hard to like wrap that where people asking for proof of some man floating in the sky, they're way off the bat. They're like, that's it, as Ken Wilber likes to put it. It's like the difference between the pre-rational, rational and trans-rational phase where it's like pre-rational is more, uh, like Bible thumper, like this is the ideology, nothing goes against this, this is law. And then rational is like more atheistic, where it's like that doesn't make sense, reality is material, we are like this is it, it's kind of like nihilism is baked in there as well. And then trans rational is like pulling the same values, like transcending and including the same values from both of those into something relatively new. So it's pulling the truths from both the atheistic and the religious mindset into, okay, I had a wrong perception of what God is, but it takes cognitive development and self-development to actually get to that point. It takes open-mindedness and being willing to challenge your own beliefs to actually reach that point, right? So for all of this, like, I don't talk about it too much and I would need to write about it more before I can actually truly articulate my beliefs on it. But actualize.org and Ken Wilber, you there were all along the same lines in many different things. So that's kind of my perspective. Yep. Um, in terms of writing the book, that is really all of my best ideas. It, it's like all of my best ideas culminated into one and the connections between those because that can't be gotten across in like newsletter or YouTube video where every time I write one of them, I feel like I have to write an entire book to get the complete message across because there's always something missing, right? Because if I'm going to teach someone, oh, here's how to live a good life, that's going to take, it's like, how do I condense an entire lifetime down into a book? And especially from my worldview and the things that I've done. And so that's really it. It's like, Here's how you find me. The subtitle of it is find meaning, reinvent yourself and create your ideal future. And so find meaning is kind of that's my way of illustrating what God is or just finding. Um, finding meaning like in life, in suffering. And I don't only talk about God because that has a very like Western Western connotation. I try to bridge many patterns from all cultures and what they're saying and illustrate it in that sense as to like, and how to use it in your practical life. And then reinvent yourself is pretty much how to figure out what you don't want in order to figure out what you want and how to prior prioritize certain things in your life in order to get there and how in order to get to new levels in your life, you're going to have to change who you are in order to get to that point. You're going to have to sacrifice or kill off the past version of yourself because you can think of it as like a hot air balloon floating up, but all of these little like sandbags are dangling from it. And in order for it to get up to the next level, because like the atmosphere and it'll just sit at a certain level there, unless you cut off the excess baggage that's holding you from actualizing you. Right. And then the last one or, or like the last part of it is where the one person business, the four hour workday comes into place because that's kind of what that's what I've done. And that's what I feel is the best way for people to leverage their unique interests and curiosities and how to acquire skills in a better way than the conventional path teaches you. So it's pretty much like how to not end up like the mass masses. Is there an example in your life of recent, um, of something that, you know, maybe a decision you've decided to move forward with that you're like, you know what, actually this brought me closer to what I, I did want and I, and I realized I need to kind of pivot. Yeah. I mean, that's been the entirety of my life really, <laughs> <laughs> but as of recently, yeah, we were talking about it where, um, I was 
kind of building up and up and up in business. I started making a good amount of money and to the point where I didn't have to worry about it too much. And I'm like, okay, I have this money. I don't really know where to spend it. I don't really care to like invest it, so to say right now, because I like putting it back into the business. But then I started to think longer term and ended up finding a house or a condo that I thought was really nice. It was, it, it met, it checked like all my boxes that I had at the time. And those boxes were like, be able to walk to a cop shop, walk to the grocery store, walk to the gym. And then I ended up buying the place. And this was less than six months ago. And so my first mortgage being taken out and got here. And some of that was fulfilled where I was able to walk to the grocery store, but then the coffee shops kind of sucked and the gym sucked. And so I ended up just driving a ton more than I was previously. And so I was driving like 20 minutes north to a coffee shop that I liked and 20 minutes in the other route to the gym I liked. And I kind of moved too far south from where everyone else is. Like the local entrepreneurs in Scottsdale are all in North Scottsdale. So that's like a 35 minute drive. And it just started to add up and made me realize like, okay, I kind of <laughs> screwed myself by getting into this situation and started to reflect on like what my actual long-term goals were and my original values that I had seemed to forgotten. The main one being autonomy and just okay. being able to have choices, right? I feel like that provides a lot of fulfillment in and of itself is just having the choice to kind of do what you want looping back to the life philosophy and this big of a responsibility, a house, this with me being so young kind of restricted that to the point where I saw it leading to more ramifications down the road or just more limits and lack of freedom down the road. And the other thing here is I'm not saying that it was an overall bad decision or that people shouldn't buy houses, right? It's very context and individual independent, but at the same time and with many other things in life, I am a big believer that you can't judge what you haven't experienced. And by that, I mean that there are a lot of people that may listen to this or listen to people online and start to make their decisions or, or limit the things that they originally wanted to do because they were listening to those people. One prime example is like, oh, rich people are all unhappy, unfulfilled, this, that, and the other, you know? kind of projecting like, oh, everyone on social media is fake. And it's like, you, you will never know that because you will never have access to another person's state of mind. And by accepting that as belief and closing yourself off to a potential that you may have originally wanted and probably still do desire, you're not going to actually experience that reality. You're not going to be able to see or even prove people wrong that you can be rich and happy or you can be, um, an authentic social media personality, right? And so things like that, where I've, I, I make giant mistakes all the time in my life, but those are the things that propel me more. Those are the things that propel me most in the right direction. That makes sense. And so as you sort of like, as you have this new software project, that sounds like that's like an upcoming season after book launch, book success, mm -hmm. there's this software product that you're kind of itching to create. Um, do you take the path of kind of going and is that something that you're sort of the face of founder of, but behind the scenes, there's like a, you know, hacker doing their thing and you're partnering more with someone, or is this something that like, no, you've brought an in-house engineer or no code engineer on board. And you're, you know, this is now an internal project to the kind of Danco empire. Yeah. We're trying to build it as separate, but we're, we're, we're trying to balance like using it's so me and Joey are partnered on it right now. Joey justice. And at the moment, it's like, we're, we're trying to build it in a way where our personal brands aren't so tied to it that it's impossible to sell, but yeah. at the same time, being able to fuel it with the personal brand so that we can actually make some money with it. Right. So that's kind of the balance we're having. So it's not going to be directly tied to me or him, but we do have one developer right now, one really good developer right now. That's just a freelancer that is building it out. Um, and we're going about that pretty slow because it's more of like a passion thing. It's not, it, it'll be profitable for sure, but it's not one of those things where it's like, oh yeah, this is going to be the next 
notion or some behemoth. It's just going to be a fun little niche project that will benefit our lives a lot. Like I'm building it for myself, really, <laughs> but nice. other creators will 100% benefit from it. Oh, that's awesome. I mean, I feel like those are where the best projects come from, right? Is the ones that you're yeah. just going to scratch your own itch and it's something you genuinely need. Um, in terms of, you know, when you look at, um, you know, what you've built, right? A lot of it is around like Dan Co, right? And you talk about with the software, you know, wanting the ability to potentially exit that. So not involving yourself too much in terms of like the involvement on the brand side so that it can be separated from you and sold. I'm curious, yeah. like when you think about some of the core sort of like habits that you have adopted or will adopt to kind of get there, like what kind of comes to mind as you kind of continue that pursuit to become the most creative version of yourself? Yeah, it's really just kind of what I've been doing where it's yeah. prioritizing the things that will lead to that. But I have to be very conscious of it because it can get very habitual and robotic quick where it's like writing every morning can it has turned into many times just like okay we're going after this high performing idea we're going to write it in a way that's very well structured that i know will hit that i know will hold attention i'm going to talk about the ideas that i've talked about before and that's not bad by any means and i feel like it's necessary especially for me when i'm in a maintenance mode and i've kind of exhausted that creativity for the time being um but then the walks exposing myself to new perspectives to new information to like the challenge of understanding where in Ken Wilber's work or like even actualize.org, like that used to make zero sense to me. And now it's like this kind of becoming beginner level knowledge to me. And now it's like with Jordan Peterson, a, what he said, a lot of what he says makes sense to me now. It didn't in the past, but now it's like, okay, he's using a very interesting language here that allows him to articulate these concepts. How can I start to incorporate some of that? in my own writing so that I can slowly differentiate myself more or with Alan Watts, where he's very poetic and there's something that people like there. And so it's like, okay, what can I pull from that? And it's like slowly refining over time with the things that I really like about the things that I admire. I mean, the people that I admire. And it seems like along the journey too, right? You've kind of like, as you've become more creative, you've gotten more time freedom, you've gotten more financial freedom. And it seems like based on the, you know, the recent sort of like purchase of a house and then not sure, you know, they're like, damn, I want location freedom and the ability to kind of do whatever and have that like autonomy that's really important. Um, you know, I, I kind of resonate with that, you know, currently um, in, you know, just got back from Columbia off to uh, Kyoto, Japan for a couple months yeah. next week. Nice. Um, and yeah, like the travel side of things, I feel like for me helps unlock that ultimate creative self. I'm curious, like, you know, you get rid of the house, you're free again, you got all the autonomy you want, like where are you going and, and how do you feel like that's going to further fuel this creative pursuit? I'm going to London pretty soon. Like I, I've decided, like I just need to kickstart that travel journey nice. now and that'll kind of reinforce my decision of like, okay, sell the house, get it over with. <laughs> Cause that's annoying, man. Like it's so, the band aid. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so going to London, soon within the next two months um that'll be fun i know some people there that's the other thing about the creator thing is you just know everyone everywhere like yeah. anywhere you go you can you can just hit someone up and like have a good time there so i've always wanted i've wanted to go to japan so bad specifically tokyo kyoto sounds dope too <laughs> but I don't know. I, I really want to do like an Eastern tour because Alan Watts, like Eastern philosophy has impacted me so much where I want to find um, just people that I can stay with or just visit and learn with about that philosophy. Like, I think it would be so cool one day to have like a documentary where it's just like traveling across different cultures in the East and noting the patterns between their philosophy and like speaking to the gurus and the teachers and the masters there and just sitting down like I can see it now all visualized where it's like we're sitting down cross-legged just having like a very calm and grounded conversation that would be so cool I love that and you you know you do mention I mean there's yeah there's a hell of a lot of benefits to you know, as you kind of become a creator you know become more known in the uh you know digital waves 
um, you know, it opening many doors, like, you know, not just in your local area or just on Twitter or wherever, but like, you know, globally being able to travel around and, and, and hang out with new people and, you know, just, yeah, it opens up a ton of opportunities and increases your surface area for luck. I'm curious, like when you think about, you know, the creator fame that you've gotten over the last like bit, right? And what's been kind of like an unknown downside of it that you didn't expect? People are crazy, man. <laughs> well, like some people, I, like the the best way I can put it is Tim Ferriss wrote a blog article a bit ago yeah. that circulated like the niche place. And I don't know if I'll butcher this, but uh, the gist of it is that he almost got kidnapped at an airport because someone knew the flight that he was on and they stood outside of the like where the limo drivers stand with his name on a sign and he didn't order one of those like it wasn't like he saw it and he's like that is weird because i didn't like i didn't order a limo driver or anything and so if you would have gone with him he would have potentially been kidnapped and so it's things like that where people are out to get you especially if you're posting like business numbers or personal information online like just recently i had a scare from my dms after i posted a picture of me and my sister to my story and so after that i was just like i'm kind of done posting personal stuff for the longest time i know that vulnerability is important but security and safety of the loved people in my life is more important than that and yeah that was the main thing all i can say is that some people like very super minority are crazy but the larger you get the larger that percentage increases and so yeah i believe like personal experience and vulnerability to a specific extent to get the point across and be relatable is a very good thing but i'm personally just not a fan of like showing my personal life yeah and uh, yeah it's made me think a lot like especially going to the future when if i like when i get married when i have kids like it's it's not going online, <laughs> just plain yeah. and simple. <laughs> you know, I think having those boundaries is definitely important. And so then on the positive side, like what's been one of the biggest benefits from it? Yeah, I'd say just the friendships that you didn't know you'd find where yeah. it's like I have my best friends locally, but I also have my best friends online. And it's it's like it's easier to find the people that really resonate with your worldview where other people like in your local situation, you may find someone, but it's very uncommon to find someone that's on the exact same page as you that understands like your interests and online it's, that's all it is, is you're just following other people based on your interests and you can usually befriend them. And it's like from the start of my journey, I've been very close friends with Joey Justice and Justin Scott. I've gone to visit them multiple times. I'm going again pretty soon just because we mesh so well together awesome well no listen uh this has been a lot of fun man i appreciate you being so open and uh you know congrats on all your success it's uh no small achievement at all to be growing 5x year over year while also you know having the time freedom you have financial freedom um and just yeah the space to kind of continue to follow your curiosity and and serve so many people online, which I know I've gotten a lot of inspiration from you over the years and I genuinely appreciate it. So thanks so much. Yeah, likewise, man. I appreciate the kind words too.